The Dead Pixel Society is returning to the annual D-Scoop Global Conference. We're once again hosting a Photo Imaging Connect mini conference track at D-Scoop Edge St. Louis World Expo May 7th through 10th, 2023 at the America Center, conveniently located in the heart of downtown St. Louis, Missouri. In addition to the excellent D-Scoop Education and Networking Program, there will be four 45-minute sessions, two on Monday, May 8th, and two on Tuesday, May 9th, specific for the photo imaging segment. Go to photoimagingconnect.com for more information and to get a special $50 discount on your registration fee. Hope to see you in St. Louis in May. Welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast, the photo imaging industry's leading news source. Here's your host, Gary Peugeot. The Dead Pixel Society podcast is brought to you by Media Clip, Advertech Printing, and IP Labs. Hello again and welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. I'm your host, Gary Peugeot, and today we're joined by Mark Komen from Paul's Photo in Torrance, California. Mark has an amazing photography business and he's here to share how they built the business on constant reinvention mark how are you today hey gary what's up dude <laughs> we were just talking before it started how long we've known each other it's been a oh, long yeah. time and i've been wanting to get you on the podcast for a while and it wasn't until i was at the recent pro convention that we finally saw each other after a few years yep post covid and whatnot so for those people who don't know the history of Paul's photo, obviously you're Mark, who was yes. Paul. <laughs> Paul was my dad. Paul started the business 1961. Mm-hmm. I started working in the business in 1974. We're in our third location, third physical location. So we moved to this building in 1987. My dad retired in 2011 and passed away last year. So since 2011, my wife and I have been running the show. Um, Mm -hmm. It's been, it's a great business and we have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. We have a great community of photographers here, both professionals and hobbyists and family photographers. Mm -hmm. We're a good local resource and and it's a lot of fun being here. So So talk a little bit about the store itself. How big is it and what do you do on segs? I know you have a lab. You're Mm -hmm. not just cameras only. So the camera store is about 3,500 square feet Um, Mm -hmm. total. We have three business units, the camera store, Paul's photo, which is the corporation. Then we have the lab run by Jeff, who's our lab manager. He's got about eight part-time employees plus himself in the lab. And they have about 1,200, 1,400 square feet. And then we have the creative photo Academy. We have our, our building is divided into three sections. We have two of the three sections. The Creative Photo Academy has about 2,000 square feet, and that's where we do our classes. Um, Mm -hmm. And really not much anymore, so we'll talk about that as we go on. But our class business has grown quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Our in-store classes are now about 10% of our total class volume. So, so this isn't just a way to get people in the store. It's actually a revenue generator for the business, right? It makes a little, the classroom makes a little bit of money, but not a lot. And mm-hmm. it was never designed that way. So we started teaching classes in 1988 because I saw a need. And this was, you know, research from PMA back at the time said the average camera took two rolls of film and then it ended up in the closet or under the bed. Right. And and I knew that that was not good for our industry. And right. granted, most of those cameras were bought at, you know, the big box stores, but people couldn't figure it out. They could never catch the fire on the passion. So mm-hmm. I wanted to help people build that fire, build that passion and be able to make pictures and have fun doing it. So we started with classes 1988. We grew from a couple of classes up to a full slate of classes in 1991. And then in 1991, we started adding our offsite things. We did our first LA Zoo photo day. We did our first Eastern Sierra adventure. And in 1995, we did our first overseas trip to Germany. Mm -hmm. In 2005, we did our first safari to Africa. And it's just grown since then. So 
Nowadays, we have 250 to 300 students a month at the Creative Photo Academy, Mm -hmm. and roughly 30 of those come actually into the building anymore. Mm -hmm. So everyone else is either on location or online. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I have to thank COVID for. You know, the technology to do an online class was always there, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't accepted by the customer. You know, why am I going to pay? for a class and stay at home. Well, nowadays people, they're comfortable on the Zoom. We use Zoom platform. I know that there are other platforms out there which may be better technically, but customers aren't comfortable with them. They don't know how to log in. It's a constant problem. So we've stayed with Zoom. Everybody knows how to get on a Zoom meeting. Everyone knows how to behave now. And so people actually are preferring Gary to stay at home in their pajamas Mm -hmm. on a zoom class rather than schlepping down here to the classroom at night. But there, but you're still doing in-person events at at, a lot of in-person events, a lot of live events. I think people tend to think you have to do either or when you can do it. You got to both. We do both. So one of the things that we've learned is customers are not willing anymore to drive Mm -hmm. unless they need to be here. Mm -hmm. so you know for a photo walk of course they need to be here for a for a photo trip they need to be here if Mm -hmm. we have a touch and feel event you know Mm -hmm. like a you know canon try the new lens or nikon try the new camera event they all want to come for that Mm -hmm. but to just sit and be talked to in a classroom environment how to do this how to do that they don't need to be here anymore right and and they don't they really don't want to I find that our online classes are far more successful, better attendance, better homework, better participation than the same class given in the classroom. And why do you think that is? I mean, it seems to me like if you're doing the in-person, you're more engaged because you've made the effort. Sure. But when 25% of the people don't show up because they were late at work, the, you know, the dog was doing this, the kid was doing that, so they don't come tonight. Right. You know, that's the thing, you know, we have always believed here at the camera store, and this is one of the changes we've made when Cheryl and I took over in 2011, that every customer who walks through the door has made a superhuman effort to walk through the door. Right. And that's not something that happens easily or all the time. Right. And so you have to respect the customer's time and effort. They've come to realize Mm -hmm. That, you know, geez, they'd rather stay home and take a class, but there are some people who still want a live class. So we offer live classes Mm -hmm. just, you know, it's usually about three to one, Mm -hmm. three online for every one live class we offer. You you also do, I mean, you obviously aren't teaching all the classes, but you are, you are, have quite the video presence. If anyone follows your Facebook feed and all that, Mm -hmm. where, you know, if there's a new camera body out, you're holding it up, you're smiling. You're saying, come see it. Um, yep. When did you decide to do that piece of the marketing? Because that really does push the the effect. You do have the latest equipment and you should go there to see it. We started with that, I don't know, with, you know, when Facebook and Instagram took off, like in the 2010s, 2015s yeah. area. I can't remember. I could go look. Mm-hmm. But really with COVID is when that started. As COVID was coming in, we needed a way to to reach out to our customers and still keep them active. You know, Mm -hmm. I started March 17th, 2020 was the darkest day, the day I had to fire all my employees and we closed. Mm -hmm. And that day I started doing a video a day and I did that for 500 days Right during COVID. And people responded to that. They wanted to still be part of the Pulse Photo community, even though we couldn't get together. Mm-hmm. And luckily we were only closed, you know, about three months, but still it kept, kept the team together, kept everybody going, kept everybody shooting and making pictures. And that was, that was a lot of fun. So you've mentioned COVID a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really been a seminal event, I think, for a lot of people in various segments of the industry in terms of. Oh, you bet. It's, it's, it's an event that shook people up to their core and they realized that they had the opportunity, though, to to make some changes 
different outside of the classes where you've kind of split between in-person and online classes. What's another change you've made to enhance your business post COVID? We reduced our hours. I, I heard that a lot from people. It was just a stressor on the team. And I think my team is happier now. We cut down one hour each day. We cut down two hours on Saturdays and we eliminated Sundays. Wow. And so that now, you know, my full timers only are missing one day a week. We're all off on Sunday. Right. So everybody has one day off during the week. It's just made the team better. Mm -hmm. I don't think we we were worried about losing business. The customers have responded to our new hours. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the restaurants around us here are now closed two days. Right. And you just have to pick. You got to remember that, oh, geez, Gary, if we want this, we can't go there on Wednesday and Thursday. They're closed. Right. It's usually you it's know? Monday, Tuesday or Sunday, Monday. Well, but see, people have now started taking other days because yeah. – if everybody's closed Monday and Tuesday, there's an right. opportunity now on Monday and Tuesday. Right. Right. But I, I think that's interesting. You raised a great point on the, on the hours because I've known several retailers mm -hmm. um, who have done that because the, the feeling always was I've got to be open all the time. Right. Right. And there's almost like a, like you said, a fear. What am I going to miss because I'm not open on Sunday or I'm not open till eight or whatever the rationale was. Why do you think that's changed? That has become more more acceptable. Was it just the staffing standpoint, or do you think customer expectations have changed? I think people were willing to accept it. People mm -hmm. are more understanding. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that COVID has done for us is, you know, the communities have come together. People mm -hmm. want to shop local. They understand that we are people. Right. Right the guy who brings you your breakfast in the morning is a human being. He has a family. He has to get up and he has to come to work. Right. right. And if you want to be in the restaurant at seven, that means he has to get there at four. Right. right. They realize that we are at the camera store. We're just individual. We're people. And our customers are, we're more understanding, but then again, we have to work harder to make that trust work. Right? right. So we do a better, we try to do a better job at having items in stock where it's really a trouble. We try to be better at explaining things over the phone so they don't have to come in. You know, right. all of those things that we've worked really hard at with training and experience mm -hmm. and practice here in the camera store has aided us. And, right. you know, one of the things that I'm so happy about is we haven't, we haven't forgotten that. And right. so as we're going forward, we have a new set of tools in our tool chest, which is right. really important for me. The out of stock issues, I think, are something that are, people are still wrestling with even years later. Yeah. Why do you think that's still continuing to be a problem? Because COVID's not over in Asia. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So sim simply stated that, you know, manufacturer A cannot make everything they want. Right. So because of labor shortages, parts shortages, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. you're a camera company, you can make, and I'm making up numbers, Gary, right? You right. can make a thousand cameras a month. Mm -hmm. Which thousand cameras are you going to make? Right. Well, number one, you're going to make the $3,000 cameras. You're not right. going to make the $300 cameras because you right. can't make as enough, mo enough money selling $300 cameras as you can selling $3,000 right. cameras. Yeah. You can't, you know, there's all kinds of, issues as you know these companies have had to make decisions about what they're going to do because mm -hmm. you know we don't have the labor to build everything we don't have the labor to staff everything so mm -hmm. i'm just glad that i don't have to make those decisions <laughs> you know being in the camera store you know people always ask me about this and that, listen guys i'm sorry i don't make it mm -hmm. we just sell it we mm -hmm. try to make it easy for you, but we don't design it. We don't build it. You right. know, it's just up to us to sell it. I've also, I mean, we're not going to, before we get back to the reinvention piece, yeah. I, I'm just curious about kind of the, the used and uh, market and uh -huh. the film market. I've been hearing from a lot of dealers that this is just booming and going crazy. Do you think this is a, an ongoing trend or just a blip in the, in the I have no idea. I don't worry about stuff like that. You know, you know we you make got. hay while the sun shines, right? <laughs> and, and so I, it just kills me because we threw away hundreds of film cameras 
in the early 2000s, oh, yeah. you know, 2015-ish time frame. Right. Because you know no one wanted them. Yeah. Right? We, you know, we recycled them, we crushed them, we did whatever. And now those cameras, people want them. And I, and I feel bad because we don't have them. You know, we right. have a pretty good supply. Our mm-hmm. customers, you know, we remind every single customer that walks in the door, bring us your old cameras. Mm-hmm. And we get, you know, a box of cameras a couple times a week from somebody wow. who cleaned out the garage and they've got this and that and the other thing. And, you know, most of the time they're just, you know, run of the mill, you know, garden variety cameras. And sometimes we get some pretty cool stuff. It's really fun. That's one of the fun parts of the business. So one of the things that is intriguing about the way you've approached your business is the focus on local, right? You're, you've gone yeah. to your community. And I really think for the future of not just photo retail, but all specialty retail, regardless of type of businesses, including restaurants and things like that, is the focus on local. What do you think are some of the- Gary, wait, wait, stop. It's not local. Mm-hmm. It's relationship. Right. Well, that's, yeah, that's, so that's that was, <laughs> the question was going to be, how do you build relationships then? Right. In, you got to build relationships. You have to, mm-hmm. you know, you talk to the guy at the florist shop. When mm-hmm. I go to buy flowers for my wife, I talk to the guy and maybe he'll come and buy a camera. Right. And everybody, when I go to a restaurant knows that I'm the place where they come to buy a camera. When you're at the thing, you talk to the, the policeman who's there directing traffic. You talk to the, you know, the whoever. You got to, right. you got to talk to people. You have to build these relationships. You have to shake people's hands mm-hmm. and some people aren't comfortable with that. I understand that, but yeah, that's what it takes. And then once you shake somebody's hand, you have to back it up. Right. You have to take care of them. So. Right. Cause, Cause I think that is part of the, the challenge that people are having post COVID is I think there was a certain amount of, you know, you could count on a certain amount of business coming in and you didn't mm-hmm. have to you know, do what you're the type of business you've been doing for years, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of making those deposits in people's relationship banks, if you will, if you're going to use that. I see. I call it farming. I'm planting, you plant the seeds, you water it, you you rake it, and hopefully one day you get something out of it. So, and of course that does translate into the Creative Photo Academy, which Mm -hmm. I want to talk about as sort of a separate entity. What was the thought process about making it a separate, I mean, it's not a separate entity in the sense people don't know it's Paul's photo, but it is, it has its own website. It has its own curriculum, if you will. Right. Um, so we, we did that on purpose mm-hmm. for a couple of reasons. Number one, we ran into problems with some, some venues. Creative Photo Academy sounds like a school and right. we get a little more, more leeway because we're a school. Right. We get a little bit more, we get a little bit more street cred from the world because we're a school. Right. It's not, you know, classes at Paul's photo. Right. So, you know, it was, it was a branding move, but it's really paid off. Right. Because people know of the Creative Photo Academy. They want to come and be part of what we do. They like our logo. They like wearing the stuff. Once again, it's more fun and it gives people something to talk about and be part of, which I think is really important. And it's not just you. You've got other people helping out. How do you find educators? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Do you struggle with managing money, getting your head around investing, or you just want to make some more money to live a life on your own terms? I'm Alex Robertson, the host of the Real Wealth Podcast, and in this show, I'm going to be exploring the four C's in wealth. Controlling your finances, creating wealth, compounding your investments, and conservation of wealth in the long term. I'll be speaking to a host of experts on wealth, finance, and entrepreneurship, all to help you fast-track your journey to significant wealth. So, if that sounds like something that could help you, click on the link in the show notes below and follow the podcast today. (laughs) <laughs> it's funny because our greatest source of educators is mm-hmm. through our students. Okay. We just did a class last week on Nikon NX software. Mm-hmm. And one of our students who is a professional computer trainer in her job, she works right. for a law firm and she teaches lawyers and lawyers assistants how to use PowerPoint, Word, all that stuff. Right. I asked Heather a couple months ago, hey, Heather, do you want to teach this class? 
She says, well, I don't know how to do that. And I said, yes, you do. It's just like teaching, you know, Word, right? You're teaching another piece of software. You know, we just promoted I mean, one of our advanced students to teach one of our advanced exposure class. Mm -hmm. And then I mine my relationships with professional photographers and people right. around the world. And one of the great things that COVID did for us was allowed me to make relationships. Well, not, I already had the relationships, but, you know, Gary, if I would invite you to teach a class, take a huge effort and a lot of money to get you to teach a class here in Torrance, right? Right. Because you'd have to fly to California, put you up in a hotel, da, 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 da. It makes the economics really rough. Mm -hmm. But if you can log on and do a Zoom class for me, mm -hmm. number one, you're a lot more reasonably priced <laughs> and you're a lot more likely to do that, right? Right, 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 right. So we've got some of the biggest names in photography teaching for us when they can. So mm -hmm. it's pretty awesome. Now that's like the local classes, but then you have mm -hmm. all these excursions, which you call sure. adventures. Um, yep. And you kind of talked a little bit about how that started. Mm -hmm. um, was this like your bucket list of the places you wanted to experience and share with other people? Because I'm looking at the list here. These are some pretty amazing destinations. It, it comes from two places. Number one is what people ask for. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you about our first safari to Africa. We we're in 2003 in Munich, Germany. We had just finished a trip to Germany. And I had a dozen students around a table in a bar mm -hmm. drinking beer in Germany mm -hmm. and said, where do you guys want to go next? Mm -hmm. And Bev, God lover, said, I want to go to Africa and mm -hmm. tell me about what you want to do. I want to see the animals. I want to make pictures. Da, 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 da. And I went around the table and half the people at the table said, I asked, if I put it together a trip to Africa, are you guys going to go? And they right. said, yes. And that was probably one of the scariest things in my life because I had to write a purchase order for one hundred and twenty five thousand mm -hmm. dollars for the trip to Africa for the first right. time. But we had 15 people go. And, you know, in July and August will be our, my 16th and 17th safaris to Africa wow. with the group. You know, so that's how, you know, the Northern Lights trip started. We were in Churchill doing the polar bears in November and heard them talking about their opportunity to photograph Northern Lights in, in Churchill, Manitoba. So right. I asked the group, you know, there were 20 of us, how many of you want to come back and photograph the Northern Lights? And, you know, six or eight people raised their hands. So I booked it for May of 2024. You know, my job is to take their ideas and turn it into a trip that will work and offer the best photo opportunities possible. It sounds like a lot of what you're doing, of course, is like a good retailer should. You're listening. Yes. You're listening to what people are doing. You're responding yep. to what they're doing. Still took a leap of faith to do that first Africa trip. What Absolutely. about post-COVID? Because like you said, people's behavior has changed. Yeah. Our trip schedule has grown because people want to travel. Right. People are more conscious with their money, mm -hmm. which... Most people think that they want to do lower cost stuff, which is not true. They want yeah. guarantees. Right. They know that if they come with the Creative Photo Academy, they're going to have a great experience. It's going to be a great trip. Right. They would rather spend a little bit more money and come with us than roll the dice on somebody they've never been with before. Right. And, and that's been one of the secrets to what we've done mm -hmm. is always building an amazing experience for people. And I'll, and I'll, t I'll tell you, you know, just two quick stories. Sure. So in June of 2022, we went to Italy and that's a trip that was delayed twice due to COVID. We finally went in June and had an amazing time with 20 photographers and right. they said, we want to do it again. And I asked them, do you want to do this and this and this? And 18 of the 20 photographers signed up for going back to Italy and doing a similar trip that's a little bit different in June, July of 2024. Okay. We had a trip to Vietnam in 2019. Mm -hmm. And I got together with the same leader and we're now doing a trip to Thailand and Cambodia. And that trip never even was launched. All the people from the Vietnam trip heard about it and they all signed up and now it's full. So. so how do you determine like the optimum size for a trip? Because it sounds like most of them are 15 to 20 people. Depends on the location. Every mm -hmm. location has, you know, for example, the Thailand trip, we're limited to 20 individuals because the tour company has two vans that hold 10. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's just, that's why, 
you know, so the trip to Italy, we, our group is 24 because they have three vans that hold eight. Now that's 24 with spouses and me and all that, you know, that's all the seats there are in the van. Right. right? So you may have X number of students, plus you have instructors and like you said, people and spouses. Bring and so right. that's how we limit. So it's always about, you know, trips to the national park are mm -hmm. now limited to 12. Right. You can't take any more than 12 to a national park. So is that still, is still the case even now? Mm -hmm. wow. Yep. For groups. Yep. Wow. Well, and that's for, that's not COVID. That's for being a responsible, you know, and ecologically friendly to the environment. Right. Yeah. Cause I think that's probably a big concern too, is, you mm -hmm. know, these days with travel, people are very uh, eco-conscious, right? So you want to make sure no, and so as much as possible. If if you come with me to the to a national park, you have to be leave no trace certified. Mm -hmm. So there's an online class takes about 45 minutes or an hour to do. You have to take that class before mm -hmm. I'll let you come on a trip to a national park with us. Okay. So just so that you don't, mm -hmm. we don't want to damage anything. We want to be good citizens. Do vendors want to partner with you for these? Or are these basically vendor agnostic? People bring what they have. Well, they're vendor agnostic. Every now and then we get a vendor who will want to partner with us. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, right now, the vendors don't have the manpower really to, right. to, to send you know, their tech rep, their sales rep for four days or a week. I would mm -hmm. love to do that. I'm talking to a couple of vendors right now about trips and mm -hmm. they're just trying to be able to have, you know, Mark, we can't, we, you have to pick a time when these people don't have anything to do. Well, we can't do it that way. If right. we want to go here, this is when you go. Right, right? exactly. You have to make the time for the person. Well, you're going to go see the Northern there. Lights. You got to go see the Northern Lights when the Northern Lights are. Correct, exactly. You can't just, yeah, do it whenever. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. So, obviously, not everyone has got the decades of experience doing this kind of thing like you folks, you do. But what would be some advice to a dealer who wants to, let's say they're building the relationships in the community to do this, which most dealers are, but they want to take it to the next level. What is like the one or two things you'd advise them to do? When I started doing, so first of all, start small, mm -hmm. start with photo walks in your local community. Mm -hmm. Number two, learn from people who know what they're doing. You know, when I, before we did one photo workshop, before we did one adventure, I went on half a dozen photo workshops with other photographers. And right. I would invite any of the dealers, you know, anybody at the pro show knows that I've always invited mm -hmm. our pro brothers and sisters to, to come on one of my trips. If they want to come, I'll give you whatever deal I can. Sometimes it's a little bit, sometimes it's not much because we don't make a lot on the trips, mm -hmm. but you got to see how it's done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for years I taught classes at, pro on how to do these workshops. And I said, right up front, I want you to learn that if this is not for you, you learn that today, not right. when you got 25 people standing in front of you and you're not comfortable and you don't want to do it. Right. <laughs> or you're in Vietnam and you're not you're, and you got 20 you, you people. You want to go home, you right? <laughs> you don't want to learn at that point that you don't have the skills or the, right. or the temperament to deal with that. Right. Right. Exactly. So great, Mark. So if somebody wanted to learn more about mm -hmm. Paul's Photo and Creative Photo Academy, where do they go for more information? Paulsphoto.com, creativephoto.com. You know, I get emails all the time, mark mm -hmm. at paulsphoto.com. Mm -hmm. And you can write to me and I'll, you know, help help however I can. Well, thanks, Mark. You're, you've been an inspiration to the industry for years. Thanks, Gary. For your willingness to share these ideas and help yeah. people grow their business. So I truly appreciate that. And thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you. And to all those dead pixelers, <laughs> keep making dead pixels, baby. <laughs> listening to the dead pixel society podcast read more great stories and sign up for the newsletter at www.thedeadpixelssociety.com